everybody. What does it mean to be a Christian? Well, first of, the, first of all, what, is, what does Christian mean? Um, the, as an adjective, it's relating to professing Christianity or its teachings. And the noun itself is a person who's received Christian baptism or is a believer in Christianity. This I've taken from a dictionary, as you might have guessed. Um, it seems to be quite a reasonable definition. It's interesting, however, that it defines a Christian as a person who has received Christian baptism or is a believer in Christianity. In other words, if either one of these two conditions hold, then you're termed a Christian. Although the Christian world would generally agree with this, as Christadelphians, we would, uh, we would claim that the word or should be replaced with the word and. And so it, should, it would read, a person who has received Christian baptism and is a believer in Christianity. This means that we believe firmly that a person should be baptised into Christ as a first step into becoming Christian. You might argue with that the first step is repentance before baptism, I understand that. Um, and you might believe yourself to be a Christian in that you've come to Christ and begun a step, uh, begun in the, in the journey towards uh, baptism. But uh, as far as Christ is concerned, as far as God is concerned, baptism is uh, really the first, the first step in coming to him. Now, there are, two, there are two verses which back up what I've said. One is from Mark chapter 16 and verse 16. He that believeth and is baptised shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. If he had meant he that believeth shall be saved, he would surely have said so. It clearly includes and is baptised. And it, it seems reasonable to me that he expects us to believe what he says. And then, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And that's another quote taken from uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 3, and verse 5. So it seems quite clear that baptism is, is important. When we understand a little more about the meaning of baptism, then we should be able to see why it is important. When a person is baptised or fully immersed in water, it is a symbol of Christ's death and our own death to sin. In the case of Jesus, though, of course, he did no sin, but he bore sin in his body, in his human nature. And this is how he would have had that victory over sin on our behalf, as our representative the rising out of the water of baptism represents the resurrection of Jesus and our own rising to a new life in Christ where hopefully we will be transformed to be like him. We'll talk more, we'll talk more about what that means shortly. So the act of baptism is, is full of meaning for the Christian and associates himself or herself publicly with Christ. If we do not think baptism is necessary, then we're quite simply being disobedient and, and rebellious towards God's will. And if there's one thing about Jesus' life that stands out, it is that you will always find him doing his Father's will. In Philippians in chapter 2, verse, th verse 8, we read, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Now I want to talk a little bit about what Christianity doesn't mean. Uh, you might be thinking that's being a little bit negative. And surely you want to be talking about what Christianity does mean. And I'll come to that uh, shortly. But I think it's more important that we don't bring wrong faith or wrong doctrine to Christianity. Because God wants people to worship him in spirit and truth. According to John in chapter 4 verse 24. And in Matthew 15, 9, we read some strong words about what God thinks of those who worship after their own manner. It says, But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Jesus is, here is talking about scribes and Pharisees, the Jewish uh, leaders, and how, showing how Isaiah's prophecy about them was coming true. A major problem for Jewish converts to Christianity was that they found it hard to let go of the law of Moses. The, these were laws or commandments given by God to his chosen nation Israel when God himself 
ruled the people in the promised land, which we now know as the modern day Israel. Many Christian Jews still believed that they had to be circumcised, that they had to eat, and cer eat certain foods and not others, and that the Sabbath was still to be kept holy. Don't get me wrong, in themselves these are not bad things, but the problem was insisting Gentiles or non-Jews also had to follow these codes. And they were attempting to bring the law into Christianity, something which Jesus had fulfilled or completed in his perfect self-sacrifice. The new commandments of Christ were laws which were to be written in the heart of men. They were to be driven by a right spirit and attitude born out of a love for him and his ways. And those ways were fundamentally the ways of his father. So the change was a, a higher calling. The principles, attitudes and character summed up in a love for God and one's neighbour, one's fellow man. This was the effect that the law was meant to have, but the people just made them into a set of rules and regulations. So to carry on in this vein, as some Jews wanted to do, would just suffocate the spirit of Jesus that, that Jesus had come to uh, promote. Because they would see God as, as someone who required them to do things rather than be encouraged to develop the mind of his son. And now today in our modern world, we... we we have so many people who call themselves Christians and yet how many of them hold to the true teachings of the Bible? How many of them actively read the Bible and even know what Jesus said? How many of them hear what Jesus said and decide to give their own slant on what he said? A kind of watering down of the message so that it would be, it would better suit their own lifestyle or way of thinking. So I put it to you that if we call ourselves Christian, we cannot change the Bible. We cannot treat our faith and following of Jesus as a hobby that we, we do when we have a few minutes spare at the end of the day. Or we cannot make it into a, a Sunday only thing. And we cannot choose what we want to believe because it appeals to us. So in short, all this is what being a Christian should not be about. So what does it mean? What does it mean to be a Christian? In Matthew 5 gives us a good idea because it, 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 it tells us a lot about what Jesus uh, said. So what does it actually mean? Well, before we go into the detail of what Jesus actually said and maybe what the writers of the Bible tell us about what it means, we should quickly remind ourselves what we said a few moments ago about attitude. Remember, we, we read that Jesus humbled himself to the will of his Father. He certainly had a will of his own and he was tempted to, at times to carry it out. We remember the temptation in the wilderness was a, a classic example of this when Jesus successfully resisted in doing the thing that would satisfy the needs of self. Humility then is key if we, we are to listen to and carry out God's will for us which we'll come to understand by getting to know him and his son Jesus through the reading of the Holy Bible. I mentioned uh, that about being transformed, being changed into a new person after rising from the waters of baptism. This mind of transformation, a readiness and willingness to change from the sinful and maybe godless ways of the old life towards the life-giving spiritual ways of the disciple of Christ has to pervade our lives. We have to be ever reaching out to adopt the teachings of Christ into our own thinking, into our hearts and minds. A verse in, in Romans chapter 12 sums this up. It's verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What did Jesus actually say that we can think about and hopefully apply to our lives in an attempt to follow him. Well, in truth, there are many inspirational and wise words which came from the lips of our Lord, and it would be impossible to look at them in, in the time we have today, but we'll just take a, a few of them. And to start with, something really groundbreaking. 
a Pharisee who was a lawyer asked Jesus which was the greatest commandment in the law of Moses and Jesus answered him and this is in Matthew 22 verse 37 to 40 thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind this is the first and great commandment and the second is like unto it thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets so Jesus effectively summarised the ten commandments into just two to love both God and your neighbour by being faithful to just these two things then the disciple of Christ would be but would by default conform to the Ten Commandments and the Law of Moses. The detail of the law was not important. It was irrelevant to the man or woman who lived under the law of love because under this law of, of love, the very character and qualities of the spirit which, spirit which belong to the Father and Son would be demonstrated. And notice too, verse 39 says, and the second is like unto it. What Jesus is saying that it is that if you love God in truth, then it follows that you will love your fellow man. If you love, if you, sorry, if you hate your neighbour, therefore you cannot possibly love God. Or, conversely, if you love God, you cannot hate your neighbour. The special love which is of God and which Jesus revealed in his interaction with men and women in, in his short time on earth is, I believe, the same thing which G James calls the royal law. In fact, verse 8 of James 2 confirms this. And it says, If ye fulfil the royal law, according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself, ye do well. And James explains in the early verses of this chapter that we, we must not prefer certain people above others. We cannot show favouritism to people because they are rich, or well-dressed, or well-educated, attractive, and so on. He's saying that the love of Christ is not partial and should never discriminate in this way. This should make us sit up and think because our natural behaviour is to gravitate towards people who we like, who we get on with, maybe a similar age and interest. But here we are being exhorted to deny these impulses and consciously seek out those who may be unpopular, maybe those who are not easy to talk to, uh, those who appear lonely or even sad. And if our love is genuine, it should also show itself in a willingness to help and do whatever is in our capability for any of our Christian brothers and sisters, whoever they might be, and as a result of putting their needs first before our own. And this self-sacrificial love is not restricted to fellow Christians, but may be shown to anyone whose need we are in a position to meet. So Matthew 5, which we read earlier, our president read, is simply a wonderful chapter in revealing to us what it means to be a disciple of Christ. The chapter is well known as the Sermon on the Mount and, and opens with the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek, the merciful, the pure in heart, peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Blessed here means a joy or happiness which is a continual state of being and not just a, a fleeting thing. Having said that, however, I can understand if you're puzzled at Jesus saying that a person who is poor in spirit or who mourns or who is persecuted for righteousness' sake should be joyful. Well, let's look at these. I think the poor in spirit, he's talking about somebody with a, uh, a hum humble approach to God and Christ and his word as opposed to a person who's rich in spirit who may be a little bit arrogant who may be a little bit who maybe think thinks that God's ways are his ways those who mourn them rather than their own loss it is for their own sins for the sins of other believers and those of the world as Christians, we should mourn over sin because God hates sin. And in the case of ourselves, really look at our sins and search for ways of overcoming them through prayer and reading our Bibles. 
and being joyful if we are persecuted for righteousness sake this is one of those things that it's far easier said than done but we see this very thing demonstrated in the Lord Jesus himself in Hebrews in chapter 12 we read this looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and sat down on the right hand of the throne of God and the book of Acts we also read about Paul and Silas in a cold damp prison having been beaten and no doubt bleeding from their wounds doing what nothing other than singing hymns and giving praise to God persecution is something a Christian can expect he should not be surprised when it comes and that can lead to all kinds of hardships including death itself and joy should come first of all from doing God's will and secondly because the Christian knows of the eternal reward that awaits him in the future of, in the future kingdom of God when Jesus returns so continuing with the uh, Beatitudes blessed are the meek this is nothing to do with weakness but having a readiness to listen to God and his will for us it is having a teachable spirit born out of humility blessed are the merciful this is just what it says showing mercyful to others just as God showing, showing mercy to others just as God has shown mercy to us by giving his son as a living sacrifice for our sins so that through him we can come to God and have the hope of life without end in the kingdom and that mercy should be boundless and unconditional and if we can at all help it our mercy should never be replaced by judgment blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness if we are a true Christian then we will, be, we will love God as we have seen this means that we should be striving to know God and his son and be zealous in following their ways Jesus referred to himself as the true manna from heaven or if you like the true bread from heaven we eat and drink in our mortal lives to remain alive but ultimately food and drink will not keep us alive forever only eating of the bread from heaven and drinking of the living water that Jesus provides can do that blessed are the peacemakers this isn't really talking about world leaders seeking uh, world peace although these people can be commended for their attempts to do so it's talking more about a disciple of Christ trying to bring peace into their relationship and interactions with others and with God and it's about following biblical principles such as being slow to anger turning the other cheek not seeking revenge and seeking to do good towards those who might be thought of as your enemy and finally blessed are the pure in spirit or the pure in heart as other versions have it and what this is saying is this just doing is not enough motive is everything all we do we must do for the love of God this is the only motive he accepts we must not do them from fear or for praise or as a burden or a duty or in self-importance or to impress others or in a competitive in a competition or rivalry there are many many motives and the deceptive natural human heart is many faceted and complex but all must be purged out leaving only love remaining and then the heart is pure much of the rest of Matthew 5 and Jesus sayings are quite remarkable they're teachings which are quite simply revolutionary when compared to human nature and go completely contrary to our instinctive behavior and attitudes we'll look at just one or two of these and hopefully uh, talking just uh, taking just what he's saying let's look at verse 21 and 22 to begin with you've heard that it was said of, of them of all time thou shalt not kill and whosoever thou shalt kill shall be in danger of the judgment but I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment and whosoever shall say to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council but whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire this word raka simply means a fool or an idiot we may never witness a murder in our lifetime but we will certainly witness people being angry for no reason and calling each other fools or maybe even several times a day 
But Jesus is saying this is just not good enough. And you will be judged for this treatment of your brother, the person you are meant to show love to. I would encourage you, as we go through these sayings of the Lord, to put yourself in the place of the one being instructed. And as you do that, think to yourself whether you have acted in the wrong way, uh, which we probably all have at some point in our lives, and think about the challenge for you in adopting Jesus' words. In other words, the right way. So, there we go then. How do we go on getting angry with people for no reason or calling someone else a fool? The Bible teaches there is a right way to approach people who offend us. And it has to be done gently and with love. And not in, in any dismissive and superior way. The next challenge from Jesus is in verse 27 and 28. You've heard that it was said of all time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I said to you, I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. If we take Jesus literally here, and I don't believe there's any reason not to, then I would guess most of us would find this hard. And of course, this would apply to whosoever looketh on a, on a, looketh on a man. At least Jesus is developing in us a consciousness of these things, which, if it matures within us, should help us recognise when these wrong actions and thoughts are taking root in us and so hopefully prompt us to put a stop to them and seek forgiveness if we've overstepped the mark verse 38 you've heard or 39 you've heard that it hath been said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth but I say to you that you resist not evil but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek turn to him the other also Again, Jesus is showing us the better way, which is driven by such qualities as love, grace and mercy. He is urging us not to seek revenge, even though it had been catered for under the law of Moses. I think what is not meant here is that we encourage others to sin against us. But there is certainly no retaliation, and we are to present the same face to the one who strikes us. In other words, we're not to deny the good for which we are being punished. The first century followers of Jesus, such as Paul, did not allow their opponents to prevent them from preaching their faith, even though it meant, might have meant they would be killed for their efforts. And the last one I want to look at is in, uh, in this chapter is in verses 43 and 44. You've heard that it, it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbour and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them who despitefully use you and persecute you. Be honest, how hard do you find this? For me, this is the hardest of the sayings we've discussed. Because not only does it exempt you from retaliating against your enemy, but no, we've been told to do good things for them. Sometimes the last thing I want to do for someone who's being horrible to me is to make them a cup of tea. We, we could be being deceived physically or verbally we could, sorry we could be being deceived physically or verbally attacked lose our job because of a false accusation anything like this where we suffer through no fault of our own and Jesus is asking us to do good to them and even pray for them and ultimately forgive them but in these sayings hard and lofty though they might be Jesus is not asking of us the impossible He's not asking of us things he himself wasn't able to do. And that's the whole point of being a Christian, following Christ, taking his ways and commandments as our, our example and template for living. So to summarise what we've talked about so far, Christianity is not a sudden change. One minute you are not a Christian and the next minute you are. It begins with answering your consciousness and realising that you are a sinner and need to seek forgiveness we declare our intention to seek this forgiveness and so begin a new life through baptism a symbolic act also one of obedience to God's will for us and as we said that Christianity was not about a set of rules or laws that have to be followed like the children of Israel were subject to in the Old Testament times under the law of Moses but instead it was about an attitude of mind 
which has the love of God and fellow man at his heart. And as Christians, our faith has to be 24-7 and based firmly in the truth of the Bible. As we said, we are to come to God in spirit and in truth. After baptism, then, we begin a lifelong ambition of, of being transformed to become a new creature, one with the mind of Christ, who displays the love of Christ on all different facets of the Beatitudes and the commandments of Christ, as well as something we haven't got time to go into, the fruit of the Spirit, which, again, is like an expansion of the qualities of love to be sought by the man or woman in Christ uh, and with some similarity to the Beatitudes and Commandments we read in Matthew 5. So the fruit of the Spirit, you, you'll find these listed in Galatians and chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. And I would recommend you take time to read them and think about how each one of them may be embedded into a Christian character. I would like to finish by thinking about two things. The first is not the detail of being a Christian, which I hope I've helped to open the door to a little bit this afternoon, it is, if you like, a glimpse of the task ahead of us. I believe that being a Christian can be the hardest thing in the world. Indeed, the Bible seems to argue that it should be. Yes, the Christian has been freed from the burdens of the law, but he has been freed to become the servant of Christ. Seems a bit of a paradox, that, but as we've seen with the sum of, with the sum of Christ's commandments, they are so hard to carry out. But as his servants, we make him our master. And what kind of servant does not carry out the commands of his master? Elsewhere in the New Testament, we're exhorted to walk in the light. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. And there is the instruction to put on the Lord Jesus Christ in Romans 13. Ephesians 6 urges us to put the armour of God put on the armour of God in order to fight a spiritual warfare. All these things, walking, putting on and warfare, involve action. But this action or these actions are not isolated good works. They can't be. They must come from and arise out of faith, a belief in those teaching and principles which are of God and his Son, which realise which, uh, realize themselves in, in, in our total trust in them. Whatever we do, we must be born out of faith. We're told that without faith, it is impossible to please God. So good, good works then should be the consequence of having a faith which pleases God and not from the mistaken understanding that good works can somehow earn one favour in God's eyes. I'm not going to try to give examples of what these works might be. Suffice to say that they should all involve that higher true love, agape love, is the Greek uh, word for love here, which should be demonstrated by people who truly attempt to put into practice the words of Jesus. This will mean self-sacrifice, giving up your own will to help a person whose need is greater. It might involve giving up hobbies or personal ambition in order to serve your brothers or sisters in Christ, but it should certainly involve giving up those things which erect a barrier between ourselves and God, those things which we might feel ashamed of doing, it might involve us having to make a decision to put God first, even before our own families. In Matthew 12, verses 46 to 60, we read, while Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and his brothers stood outside, wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside, wanting to speak to you. He replied to him, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Or whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. And for love's sake, we have to suffer persecution for our beliefs, as we have already touched upon in our discussion of the Beatitudes. Some people like to paint the picture of that Christianity is a religion of do nots, do not swear, do not take revenge, do not boast, and so on. While these things are good, I find it better to think of Christianity as a religion of do's. Not to say that these are not to say what these are, given that they are done in faith, then the more we do the do's, the less we have to worry about the do nots. So I think you will now appreciate, if you don't already, the levels 
of love and zeal and obedience required to be a Christian today. But it has always been so since Jesus walked this earth. Nothing's changed. And I want to finish on a positive note because a true Christian has been promised a wonderful reward, a reward which God will give to the faithful believers when his son returns to the earth to set up his kingdom. And what will that reward be? Everlasting life. To live forever with people who know and love God, with Jesus ruling as the king of the world. Let us just turn up one more passage to show this. And it's 1 Corinthians 15, 22 and 23. For as, as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Thank you for listening.